It's such an honor to be here. I love this ministry. I love Global. I love Randy. It's nice to finally meet you, Tom. It's a joy to be here. And uh, I have so many friends here. Shara and Danny are here. Jerry's here. Good to see you, Jerry. I see Jerry everywhere I go. <laughs> Jerry, I was just here, I think, I don't know, three months ago maybe, for a Catch the Fire event. John Arnott read my bio word for word <laughs> as the crowd had holy laughter. It, and then he couldn't finish it. It was the most bizarre intro I've ever had. So I asked Tom, please don't read my bio. I don't want that to happen again. <laughs> But uh, we had a great time here with, with the Gots and John and Carol and Duncan was here. It was just a wonderful time. I just want to say uh, how honored I am to be here, uh, what a privilege it is. I love Randy and uh, we're all indebted to Randy's yes and what the Lord has done in him. Um, I've asked Randy to lay hands on me every time he's with me and uh, it's partially why I said yes to this invitation. <laughs> Just being real, I, now, now when they come in I go, yep, I need an impartation there, I need an impartation there, and this certainly is a place where I have come hungry for the Lord, as I'm sure you have. Amen? Amen. I was just with Randy in Sao Paulo, Brazil. We invited him to the Sen. Jesus Image has the privilege of uh, making up one, one seventh of the send. There are seven of us who work together on it. Uh, we said yes uh, at the one year anniversary of Billy Graham's death uh, in Orlando. And to our shock, 58,000 people came and flooded our stadium. And the name of the stadium is called Camping World. <laughs> and I felt like that was prophetic too, that the Lord is wanting to dwell among his people and that his glory would actually fill, fill these evangelistic events. That it wasn't this either or. Do I have to preach the gospel or have his presence? It was, we're going to preach the gospel from the cloud of his presence. And that's what's, what's happening. So it actually started uh, the week after Billy Graham died in a small meeting. Uh, I was always taught by my father-in-law, for those of you guys who don't know, his name's Benny Hinn. You may, have, may, may not have heard of him. Uh, but that's my father-in-law. So... I got saved and healed in this meeting in 1989 as a Greek Orthodox young boy and uh, got absolutely tasered by the Holy Spirit that night. Had never been outside of a Greek Orthodox church. It was the most wild uh, experience of a Protestant setting I have ever seen. I, and uh, it worked. <laughs> I can't really explain it. But it certainly worked. And so my father-in-law always taught us, look for two people to pass away. And then a great move of the Holy Spirit would come. Oral Roberts and Billy Graham. And Oral was very close with us. Or Oral was very close with me personally. And uh, I would sit with him when I pastored in, in Southern Cal and uh, ask for advice. And uh, sometimes I liked it. Sometimes I didn't. Quite often I did not like it. But... <laughs> Fifteen years later, he was right on just about everything. Uh, but we were taught to look for those two, two passings. And um, when Oral died, uh, we knew the next one to go would obviously be Dr. Graham. And so when Dr. Graham died, I called my father-in-law that morning. I, was, I, I used to spend six months a year in Reading. And so I was in Reading at the time. And Dr. Graham passed, and I called my father-in-law. I said, hey, Dr. Graham's gone. And we prayed. And we prayed that the Lord would have mercy on us and allow us to see this great move of God that is here now. And, what, and we asked uh, that he would include us in it. <laughs> we didn't want to ride the pine and ride the bench. We wanted to be out there uh, in the presence of the Lord and watch him do what he was doing. I then called Lou. So I called Benny first and then Lou. And our team had just been on a fast. I know I had. And it was a 40-day fast. And I called Lou. I said, Lou, Dr. Graham's gone. What do we do? <laughs> he goes, we should go on a 40. And I'm like, just got off one. There's got to be another way 
There's got to be something else. He goes, well, I just came off a 60. We can, you can go 40. And I'm like, Lou, I, no, I'm not doing another fat. He said, well, can we meet? So we met. Myself, Todd White, Lou, um, Daniel Kalenda, the circuit riders led by Brian Brent, Andy Bird with YWAM. Uh, Jerry was actually there. Um, man, I, I'm sure I'm missing someone. Teo Hayashi of Dunamis actually joined later on. They're a Brazilian movement. But we met at CFAN, uh, Reinhard Bonnke's ministry, who was obviously living at the time, or I should say on earth at the time. And, and we, we took communion. We made a covenant that day to prefer each other above ourselves and to lay down our names for the sake of Jesus and to pool our finances, to pool our our uh, influence to um, pull our connections and our relationships and reach out to fathers and mothers and ask them to run with us. And so a year after that, which would have been last, last February, we went to uh, Camping World st Stadium by faith. And man, the people just stormed the place. And God's power moved in such an incredible way. Thousands were healed, thousands were saved. I think 5,000 signed up for missions. So we felt to take that to Brazil. And I, I don't know when we got back, but it seems like yesterday. Yeah, it's been a wild ride. But we went and Randy, we invited Randy actually to both, but he was able to make this one. But the first stadium sold out in six hours. 85,000 people. You can give Jesus praise. Because that's amazing. So the Lord broke Coldplay and U2's record. He shattered it. Not even they sold out that quickly. That's awesome. So then we, de yeah, we decided by faith to take a second stadium called Allianz Stadium. We took that one by faith. That one sold out, I think, in a day. That seated 60,000 people. So then we felt like we should go to Brasilia and our contacts on the ground there said, look, much of the corruption and the injustice is really flowing out of Brasilia. We need to take that mountain for Jesus. Let's take that stadium too. And so we did. And we held three simultaneous stadium meetings, just like 10 days ago or whatever, a week ago. And it was so precious to me to watch Randy walk into the stadium because he's been going down, I think, since 84 or 87, something like that, 84. And he just instantly started crying. Was anybody down there? Anyone in Brazil? No, you guys were watching. You watched it, okay, good. So Randy just started crying, and I, it was my job in the first stadium to open up with the gospel. And while I was preaching the gospel, Randy was sitting in a chair crying. And it meant so, Heidi was doing what she does, you know, laying on her little pillow thing. And Claudio, ripped my face off before I went out there <laughs> and uh, all the fathers and mothers were there cheering us on but I sat next to Randy when I was through preaching the gospel and I said Randy what's this feel like and he just started weeping he said all the years all the sacrifice the small meetings the big meetings praying for those who didn't get healed and to see these young people I think like the average age was 24 years old so amazing. It's incredible. And the president asked if he could come. We did not invite him. He asked if he could come. Well, then leaders started, they flew in and started begging us to come to their nations. All that to say, the Jesus movement is here. It is here. It is here. And so I want to talk about Jesus tonight. Is that okay? I only have one message. I used to have like 12. And an old preacher named Rex Humbard, I don't know, I, I love the old fathers and mothers, but he told me I'd never become dynamic until I became specific. Wow. Yeah. And if I could give advice to any young preacher here, it would be to preach Jesus. Because it's the Father's only sermon. This bothers people. 
But now listen. Can I come down? Am I going to mess up the footage? But let me just, I'm coming down. All right. um, I was raised in healing crusades. Raised. I've seen some wild stuff. I have seen a lady, I wasn't in this meeting, but I watched the footage, bring my father-in-law her tumor in her hand. And it smelled, so there was this guy he was going to fire, so he made him hold it. <laughs> On the platform. <laughs> like, like oh, that stinks, you hold it. <laughs> it's like punishment. He had to hold it. I have seen some wild stuff. I mean, I have seen cripples pop up. I've, I think 30 wheelchairs emptied in 90 seconds. So, I have been healed. And, and let, me just, let me just say this. If you're sick, you want to get healed. And Jesus is okay with you coming to him to get healed. You know, the people who came to him did not come to him to love, love him initially. And he was okay with that. He would ultimately hope they would fall in love with him. Some did, some did not. So let me just be, I want to be very clear. I, I love the healing ministry. I am unapologetically uh, in the healing ministry. I don't feel like I have the right to not be. Because uh, Jesus paid in blood so that the sick would be healed. So never forget this. Ultimately, we are to have a compassion for the sick. It is the compassion of Jesus. But if you want eternal fruit and you want your offering at the throne to pass through holy fire, you have to do it unto Jesus. So our primary motive is not the sick being healed. It's his stripes not being wasted. Now if you get that, if you get that, you'll pull the trigger 24-7 with the right motive. There are many who've healed the sick and left the faith. Many. So I just want to be really clear. I am in the healing ministry. And I don't have the right to turn it off. There were many before me who paid a price for a breakthrough, Randy included, Bill, my father-in-law, Catherine, all of these amazing people, Reinhardt, Oral. I don't have the right to not bring a harvest when they paid such a dear price. We live with an indebtedness to Jesus, first of all, and also those who've gone before us. That's why Hebrews reminds us of the great cloud of witnesses. Steve Hill told me this. You guys remember the Brownsville Revival? Remember Steve Hill? How many of you have never heard the name Steve Hill? Okay, Steve Hill was the evangelist at the Brownsville Revival. He sat across the table for me and he said this, I will not change the gospel. He said, I don't want to sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb and explain to a martyr who was sawn in two why I changed the gospel that he died for. I was young. I had just started the ministry. I was like, this guy's thinking on a totally different plane. <laughs> who even thinks like that? So we don't have the right to say no to the sick because we didn't make the payment. Do you understand? We don't have the right. If someone's suffering with depression and you don't think it's a big deal, you still pray for them. Because if you had it, it'd be a big deal. I used to not care when people came to me with, for prayer about anxiety. Because I didn't have it. And then I went through it and I thought, I'd really like this to leave. Can someone get this devil off me? Do you know what I mean? Does somebody have the chops to rip this off of me? So. It all matters. It all matters. People matter. The stripes of Jesus matter. His blood matters. The cross matters. Healing is part of the atonement. Do you understand that? It's part of the atonement to the ancient church Israel in the wilderness. The Lord said, look and live. Looking unto Jesus brings healing. Even if you were a mile away from that brazen serpent, if you looked in that direction, you got healed. Even if it was cloudy. 
I mean, two million people, I've been in a crowd of a million, that goes to until the horizon. I've seen three million in one crowd. It goes for a mile and a half, a mile wide, two million in the desert or more. Two million children of Israel and the Lord holds up, or Moses holds up a pole and the Lord says, look and live. Through Moses, looking unto Jesus brings healing. Jesus so loved to heal the sick that he healed them without trying. So, and this isn't a healing message. This is a Jesus message, which becomes a healing message. So you see, when healing becomes a person to us, a relationship is birthed. When it becomes a process, then you can manipulate the process to feed your own ego. And that thing's just dying. It's losing its legs. Can I say it? Jesus never preached a sermon on healing. Because he is it. Now, it's totally legal. I do it all the time. But I am saying there's a place in his presence where he gets it done a lot faster than you're teaching. And better. So John 15 teaches us to abide in his presence. I, we run a school. And I thought I worked hard until we started a school. My Lord Jesus. I know some of our students are here. I see one of them. Is that you, Jim? I love you. Jim's, he's older than his 20s. I don't want to say how old he is, but he's, he's above 20. I'm amazed at some of the decisions that a 20-year-old makes. I'm blown away. I'm like, well, you, did, you said what? You went where? Do you, own a, do you own a Bible? Do you listen to our teachings? Every, you know, we are working hard. I mean, my word, and I love it, but we are working hard. My wife brings, sometimes I say, babe, don't you dare mention the students one more time. I want to watch swamp people. I don't want to talk about a single student. I don't care. They become Mormons tonight. Don't talk about them. Don't, I don't want to hear about them. <laughs> I got so bored, I took my compound bow out a while back for hunting squirrels with a bow. Just it was therapeutic. Didn't hit any, but I lost all a bunch of arrows. That's what starting a ministry school can do. When you start walking with people, you discover what works and what doesn't. And I've, I'm trying my best to do what Reinhardt said when he was in his 20s. He prayed a prayer to the Lord. He said, teach me to mind now what will matter in the end. Teach me to mind now what will matter in the end. So I just have a few questions. When the last, when's the last time you heard a teaching on the judgment seat of Christ? Because whether we teach it or not, we're not going to ignore it away. You can't create a theology to make it disappear. It's going to happen. You can't create a theology to discount the fact that Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. You can write all the books on it you want. He is coming back. It is part of the gospel. He's coming back. He's coming back to rule and reign as king. We're not going to change his mind with our theology. Not going to happen. He's coming back. He will crack open the eastern sky like a whip and come back with ten thousands of ten thousands. It is part of the gospel. You cannot like the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter. It's true. It is part of the gospel. It's proof that Jesus made it to the right hand. 
<laughs> he said, you'll know I'm there when my spirit is poured out. That's the new Michael version. That's basically what he said. Because I go to my Father, I will pour out my spirit. When Jesus made it to his destination, when the Holy Spirit came, I should say, it was proof he is seated at the right hand of the Father. All is well. And it's that last feast being fulfilled in our hearts, the Feast of Tabernacles, that God would come and live among men, like he said in Exodus 25, create for me a habitation so that I can live with you, so that I can dwell with you. It's always been the heart of the Lord. Now he lives in us. Oh. The thought of his availability can torture you in the best way. You can have as much of Jesus as you want. You mean like, what, what, as much, as much as you want. 24-7 feasting on bread that has come down from heaven. And then another verse says, who cometh down. That means he's constantly coming as bread suspended before the eyes of our hearts. Oh. The goal is not accomplishing stadium ministry. The goal is 1 Thessalonians 5, unceasing prayer. Because if you find 1 Thessalonians 5, there's not a stadium big enough. Because God is not looking for employees right now. He's looking for a bride. We're not mercenaries. I tell our students all the time, if the Lord tells you to post that guy getting saved, on the streets, that's fine. But if he doesn't, don't you dare post it. I want you living before one person's eyes. I'm okay with it. But we're not, <laughs> when somebody gets healed in our meetings, we're not surprising God. <laughs> Neither is he shocked. He's not like, well, Michael, that was amazing. How did you do that? <laughs> Never seen that before. Phenomenal. Great work. Must be your hands. You must have special hands. Are you ready for another one? Neither is the Lord learning when we're preaching. <laughs> it's like, whoa, I didn't know that about me. So communicating Jesus is different than communicating a topic. Christ, Paul said, when I preach, Christ is formed among you. Think about those words. When I preach, Christ is formed. He also said, I, listen to this, I ministered the gospel unto you as a priest. What does a priest do? He worships and offers sacrifice. He offers a soothing aroma. So Paul became like this type and pattern of this new preacher who could love Jesus and declare the gospel at the same time. And he discovered something. When my heart goes vertical, God's hands go horizontal. When my heart goes up, people get touched. So I don't... I'm not compartmentalizing this thing. It's not preaching time and worship time. My life is a worship service. So when Paul says, can I, can I keep going with this? Because this is the way you get to people touching your garment and them getting healed. This, this is the way into the greater works. Union with the Lord. You say, I have union. You do positionally, but let's not waste that position. Position is meant to lead us to experience. It's the whole point. So Paul makes a statement in 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, I pray unceasingly. Well, here's my question. 
How do you pray unceasingly if you're a barista at Starbucks? Can I get a water there, Ro? I asked one of our students, they said, I think it means speaking in tongues. I said, well, look, if you come to Jesus school, I don't want you speaking in tongues behind the register if someone tries to give you money. Just talk English to them, please. And don't blow in their face when they just give them their change, tell them Jesus loves them. Just be, be a little more normal. Please, we have to live here. When you leave, I'll still be in Orlando. <laughs> I'd rather you tip the guy well than blow in his face at the register. But <laughs> really. So they're like, what does it mean speaking in tongues? I go, well, how could that, how would that be? If you worked for ESPN, could you speak in tongues on your, on your uh, telecast? I used to play professional golf for a living, so if I prayed unceasingly and it, was meant, and it was limited to speaking in tongues, I'm not sure how many putts I'd make if I were speaking in tongues. Especially if I got the revival jerks over a three-footer on fast screens. That'd be hard. <laughs> what is Paul talking about here? What's he talking about? When prayer becomes a person, you find that prayer is joined, not generated. Zechariah 12 speaks of the Holy Spirit as the spirit of prayer. So what do you call somebody who runs? A runner, okay, there you go. What do you call somebody who golfs? What do you call somebody who gardens? What do you call someone who prays? A prayer. Prayer is a person. Prayer is joined. That's why the Holy Spirit is a river. We don't create the river. The Holy Spirit has an agenda. He is constantly moving. He is not stagnant. He has an agenda. And the scripture teaches that he actually turns us into living epistles. So when we discover that the point is unceasing, unending fellowship with the Holy Spirit, oh, I can do that if I'm making a cappuccino. Whether my mouth is moving or not, that I can do. That's what Catherine did. That's where Heidi lives, like nobody else I know. And let me just say this. If if, if you're the type of person who believes that you can just stumble into abiding prayer, don't buy that lie either. Because the scripture says in Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. Abiding is the result of a secret life of prayer. I have many people who go, I don't need to lock, I don't need to shut my door, I don't need to lock away. I'm always praying. I'm like, bro, that sounds good, but it's just not the truth. So the Psalm 91 secret place births the abiding place. And it's in the abiding place where this unceasing, unending fellowship begins with Jesus. And this is our great privilege. Before we are preachers, we are worshipers. Bill discovered this by listening to his father. What's the secret of all that's happened in Reading? I just talked to Bill for 20 minutes before I got here. So we're very close. What's the secret? The secret is Bill knows he's a priest. One of the great privileges was when, when Benny walked through that trial in her body. 18 months or two years ago, she reached out and we, we, we took communion like the next day. And I got to watch Bill that whole time when nobody knew. Every Sunday, I'd watch him, hands up, ministering to Jesus, come hell or high water. He knew he was a priest. It was a costly offering. It was a beautiful offering. offering. And isn't it amazing that the scriptures call offerings soothing aromas to the Lord? 
not just pleasing, but when I give Jesus this type of worship, it actually soothes his heart. Soothing is for somebody who's grieving. So Jesus grieves, that's why the Bible says grieve not the Holy Spirit. What causes him to grieve? Whatever caused him to grieve in the scriptures. If a city doesn't want him, if a city doesn't know the hour of their visitation. Remember in Jerusalem, he wept because he wanted to gather them. They didn't know the hour of their visitation, so he wept. He weeps today in his heart. If He's still the same. If he still heals today, he still feels deeply today. My worship brings a soothing to his heart. This is the bridal place. So I watched Bill for those months. Every single time he had an opportunity, he'd worship Jesus. Before he's a pastor, he was a worshiper. Before he's a leader, he's a worshiper. Before he's a preacher, he is a worshiper. Catherine was so caught up in worship one time, my father-in-law told me, that by accident she stepped off the platform. I think it was at Stamba Auditorium in Youngstown, Ohio, or at First Pres in Pittsburgh. She stepped off the, 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 the platform, hovered in midair, singing, gone. Just completely gone, and then an invisible power pulled her back, straight back onto the platform. These, this thing hap these types of things happen in John G. Lake's meetings. All the time, except it happened to people in the front row. Jesus is wanting to bring us into the depths of fellowship. The depths. It's not so much what we can do. Because the longer I'm walking with him now, I'm discovering I'm really not that good. The first thing we said when those stadiums filled in the sand, the collab got together and we go, hey, we're not that good. Nobody's this good except Jesus. So now we booked the one in uh, Kansas City for October at Arrowhead Stadium. And we booked it before we knew anything about Bob Jones's word. And it looks like we're going to need the stadium next door to that, where the Royals play. Why, why, why am I telling you this? The Lord is on the move. But he's not using the strong. <laughs> he's not using the ones who love their bios, <laughs> who are convinced that they have qualified themselves. Jesus uses the needy. That's why he reclined at Bethany. The word Bethany in the Greek means house of poverty. Not social poverty, internal poverty. Matthew 5.5 5 poverty. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The hearts that say, without Jesus, I don't want to live. Without Jesus, I don't want to go on. And if it's a preacher, they're saying, my worst nightmare would be to preach about you and not know you. He can do great things with the needy, with the lowly. Do you think it's a problem that the church knows more about binding and loosing than it does the Beatitudes? or which portal is open over Appalachia County, but we don't know John 1. I'm just being honest with you. How can the Jesus people not know the Beatitudes? You say, well, I'm not really that into Jesus. Then what, what are we into? Because if it's not about Jesus, by default, it has to be about something else. So what, what, what is it about? What is success? What is true north? How do I, what, what do I need to mind now so that when I come to the end, all is well? When we sing, here's a question. How do we know it was a good worship set? 
You, I do love you, by the way. I'm just trying to fluster you a little bit. I just want to get you to think. See, because I've been in the green rooms and I've been in the stadiums and I've preached on some of the greatest platforms in the world and I can tell you, none of that feeds your soul. It's an honor to meet people. Don't get me wrong. Like, I would, I would hang out with Randy. I mean, if he asked me to wash his car, I would do it if he just hung out there. So, uh, I, I'm into that. Like, I believe in honor. But what I am saying is this, that people do not feed your soul. Only Jesus feeds your soul. So what, what is the Christian life? How many Christians do we have here? Okay. 19 Christians. It's good to know. <laughs> Turn to John 3.16. No. What, what is the Christian life? What did we say yes to? What happened when we said yes? What were we invited into? What is the Word of God about? What is the Bible about? This holy word, this precious, holy, perfect word. The Bible says, your word, O Lord, is forever ever settled in heaven. How many of you think the Father loves the name of Jesus? He does. Philippians teaches us that Jesus earned the name above every other name. So if somebody says, hey, bro, and we do that in charismatic circles, what's your favorite name of God? Why is that even a question? Because the Father's favorite name is the name of His Son. That is the heart of every father. The heart of every father is that their son would be glorified. There's no competition in the Godhead. The Father's not like, these people love my son too much. He loves that. So as much as the Father loves the name of Jesus, heaven and earth bow their knee to the name of Jesus. Hell trembles at the name of Jesus. He honors his word above that name. Wow. Why, why is that the case? Because if the Lord changed one jot or tittle, one accent mark, not just what he said, but how he said it, we would have reason not to believe him. And his character would be at stake. And what he wants you to know is that you can trust him and know him. He is who he says he is. So the holy word of God is perfect. It's perfect. I heard a pastor say he, he had worn himself out counseling. And finally he came up with a rule in his church. I thought it was so funny. He goes, I'm not counseling anybody anymore unless you read your Bible and pray for an hour a day. Because you'd fix like 90% of my problems. I thought, I'm using that one. <laughs> so our default at Jesus School is... If somebody, every meeting we have, even if it's with staff, if there's a, a student issue, I told our team two weeks ago, I want you to, in every meeting, ask every person, are you spending time with Jesus and reading the Word of God? So it's much better that you know how to quote the scriptures than quote your favorite preacher's sermon. Because you can adapt kingdom culture lingo and have never met the king. And we do it all the time. We do. Like we, we have a whole culture around this, this thing I'm talking about. Like there's an actual, you can adapt the lingo without the encounter. But you're not fooling the Lord. Do you know what I'm saying? So what is this precious holy book about? This book is the heart of Jesus in print. I want you to think of that for a moment. Jesus said it's from the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. 
He said that of people. So if it's true of people, it's true of him. Because he never invites us into something that he is not. We heal the sick because he is a healer. We want the baptism of fire because he is a consuming fire. He said do not commit adultery because he will never cheat on us. Do you follow me? All of those invitations are invitations into his nature, not just behavioral patterns. He's expressing who he is. So when Jesus speaks, listen, it is his heart being revealed. And that's what makes him so true, by the way. Have you noticed that when the glory comes, you mean what you're saying? Like when you say praise God, you mean it. Like you actually mean it. You go a generation down the road where the glory's not there, but the lingo remains, you go praise God. And you're like, wait, praise who? God, wait, the ancient of days? The one who saved your soul? The one who has no beginning, no end? Whose eyes are fire? That one? That, is that the God you're talking about praising? Or when you say hallelujah in the glory, you actually mean praise ye the Lord. Songs mean something to you. Everything feels better, right? In the presence, we become more true because spirit and truth work together. So when Jesus speaks, he means it. I said when Jesus speaks, he means it. He really means it. That's why the enemy had to say, hath, listen, hath God really said? When I read that, I go, why didn't Eve just look at him and go, he only really says stuff. God doesn't sort of say stuff. Of course, he really said it. He is true. So when I read the words of Jesus, they are invitations into his heart. So I tell our team, don't go to your Bible. Go to Jesus through your Bible. This is the living Word of God. That being said, what is the Bible about? Well, hold on, think text. Don't. Sorry, I didn't come as evangelist to tonight. I've, I've been teaching too much in class. <laughs> think text. What, what did Jesus say the Bible is about? Let me help you. He said, the scriptures speak of me. In Luke 24, he opens the scriptures to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. He opens their eyes and teaches them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. How would you like the resurrected Christ to do a Bible study with you and show you the types and shadows from the Psalms, Law, and Prophets? That's what they got. Yeah, please, I hear you, man. Jesus sits down, resurrected, opens their eyes to the scriptures and shows them himself in the scriptures. That tells me something. Are you ready? Your Bible is not about your Bible. And this Bible is not about our favorite theology. Neither does it exist to prove that we are right. The Bible is about Jesus. He is the Word. So if we miss Jesus when we open the Scriptures, we miss it all. Bill says, if I don't meet the person when I'm reading the Scriptures, it just equips me to debate you. Isn't it sad to go to your Bible to debate someone when you could fall in love instead? So how do I know 
if I'm getting the Bible? Can you see Jesus? If you see Jesus, the feasts become exciting. If you see Jesus, you will cry reading the genealogies. You'll be like, oh my God, this is why they're here. And that is why they're there. You'll see Jesus in Noah's Ark. You think God wanted to start a yacht business? Or could he possibly have had something better up his sleeve? Was God teaching men to hunt? Well, po possibly. Thank you, Jesus. Was he teaching them how to hunt when he covered Adam and Eve with animal skins? Or was he revealing that a sacrifice would come and drip blood and cover the souls of men and atone them? Do you think the Lord was wanting to start a tent camping business when he gave Moses the pattern of the tabernacle? Moses, this is how you build tents. You're going to need tents a long time. This is how you're going to build a nice tent. The scripture says in John that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So Jesus is the type and pattern of the tabernacle. So now when you open your Bible, you start to fall in love. You see the love of God. You see the beauty of Jesus. You see the Father's desire to reveal His Son from day one. As Reinhardt used to say, when Adam fell, Adam was content to live without God. But God was not content to live without Adam. It's all about Jesus. Here's one. Did you know church is about Jesus? Because we are Christians. I, sometimes I think we've become like galactic space rangers. <laughs> I, I did a TV show, and I'm, I'm lovingly messing with you guys tonight, but I hope this keeps you up tonight. Because there's one theme in heaven. One theme. There's a lamb. Listen, there is a lamb seated in the midst of a throne. So at the center of heaven is a throne, and at the center of the throne is a lamb. When John introduced Jesus to Israel as the best man who would give the bride away to the bridegroom, he said, Behold the lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. So Jesus is the Father's obsession because He laid His life down. He has always been the Father's obsession. And Jesus is the Father's only sermon. So if the Father had a bullhorn from heaven and we gave Him three minutes, He's preaching Jesus. Why do I say that? What did He say at the River Jordan? Behold, this is My Son. What did He say on the Mount of Transfiguration? This is My Son. Hear ye Him. What caused the heavens to rumble in the temple courts in the Gospel of John? The glorification of His Son. What is Ephesians all about? The glory of Jesus in His people. Why was Colossians written? And for many, in, in many ways it was written to get the church's eyes off of mere angels and put their eyes on the one who causes angels to become flames of fire when they pass by him. I believe in angels. I've had them help me many times and I'm always happy when they do. Every time they show up, I'm very happy. <laughs> but I found something. The quickest way to get them to leave is to glorify them. They don't like it. And if you fall in love with Jacob's ladder, there will be no angel shortage. So Jesus is everything in the scriptures. He is everything in the heart of the Father. He is the focus of the Holy Spirit's ministry on the earth. Why is there another Jesus movement hitting the earth? Think about it. How many prophets said there's coming a new Jesus movement? There's coming a new Jesus movement. Many people were like, well, we already had one. 
Why do we need two? Because that's all God wants there to be, is the Jesus movement. We are married. We're married to Jesus. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't come up to an altar, have our sins washed away, and check off this box. Okay, I'm Christian now. I met this Jesus guy. He did really well for me. Thanks for dying, by the way, on that cross. Thanks for your blood, because now I feel better, and my sins are gone. I'm going to heaven. Let's move on to deeper and better things. There is no deeper and better thing. <laughs> Colossians says that in him all things consist. So the Bible says he who ascended in Ephesians also descended and filled all things with himself. So Colossians says he is all things. Ephesians teaches us that he's filled all things with himself. Pretty hard to get away from him. He is everything and has filled everything with himself, has ascended, descended in the lowest parts of the earth, the Bible says, and when he ascended, ascended above the highest heaven. Are you ready for this? And is seated up there. Oh. There is a man sitting on a throne above the highest heaven. That should make you really happy. And he is mediating the covenant. That's good news for you. That means you have a heavenly home forever because of the ministry of this great high priest who ascended above everything. Jesus is magnificent. Church is about Jesus. It's not about church. Why do I say that? Well, he bought it with his blood. He owns it. He purchased it. It'd be really sad to treat the owner like a visitor. It's his. He, he didn't buy it with an Amex. He bought it with his blood. He owns us. Ephesians calls us the house of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, and Jesus is the cornerstone. So it's his place. It's his church. He owns the church. He bought it with blood. We are his body. We are his. Worship is about Jesus. So how do we know it was a good worship set? You ready? Whether or not he came. Because if that's not the barometer, if that's not the gauge, something else is. So how many records it sold does not determine whether or not it is a good worship song. In order for it to be worship, it has to come from the Lord, has to be about the Lord, and back to the Lord. So he has to be the origin, the means, and the end. In the Old Covenant, they knew God was happy with their sacrifice when he came. Fire fell, a cloud came, his glory came. He came. So what if we worshiped that way? What if when we were singing, we were singing to him? It'll change everything. We're watching it in our city. Every single Sunday, people start lining up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon from all over the world. We never tell them who's preaching. And I'm not saying it's wrong if you do, but I didn't want to start a church, so I was like, I'm making it hard on you, Lord. <laughs> I said, if we're going to do this, they have to come for you. I don't want them coming for their favorite preacher. Because if I start building that way, then I have to have their favorite preacher in once a month. And after a while, your Rolodex runs out and you got no more famous people. It's, but that's what happens, right? Don't you? I feel like this generation is marketed out. I can't even go on Instagram sometimes. I feel like 
a beehive crawls up into my soul. Get so busy. There's a new event with a million faces on it every week. And we have teams, we gotta work harder, we gotta work harder, we gotta work harder, we gotta do this, do this, do this, do this. And, 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 and success is people, so we gotta get people in because if people come, I'm doing the right thing. Then I tweak the method to justify the end and the glory departs. So I told our crew, and they didn't like it, I said, we are not, I don't, I'm not saying it's bad because I do it for Jesus 19, but to build an environment that houses his presence, Jesus is gonna have to be enough. I'm sorry. He's gonna have to be enough. And you know what? They line up every week from Israel, from Armenia, from Romania. Every week they're waiting. They don't know who's coming. They know Jesus will be there. And I come in every Sunday like a giddy little kid. Just like, like I don't know what he's gonna do next. And we open our Bibles. I meet with the team and I say, hey guys, the scripture says Jesus loves Thanksgiving. Let's give him that. And the Bible says that this is the front door to his presence, right? We enter his gates with Thanksgiving in our hearts. So I said, okay, he's the king. We're not. We're not going to change this. I want our songs early on to be flooded with Thanksgiving. I don't want to sing songs about us. I'm preaching. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. Picking away at this dam. One ice pick jab at a time. It's not about Jesus. It's about something else. If Jesus comes, it doesn't matter if you have 200 empty seats. It's a good meeting. If you have a, a stadium filled and he's not there, it's a bad meeting. If he's not there, it's not a Christian meeting. If Christ is not there, it is not Christian. How could it be? So we thank him. We start thanking him, and we sense the room change. Because when Jesus comes, he changes what you can't see too. You know what I mean? The air moves, it changes, oh, he's here. Peace comes when you were busied. You were depressed because you were disquieted. Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you disquieted? The disquieted soul turns into a stilled soul. And in your heart, you feel like, I feel him right now, by the way. You feel like in your heart, I was born for this, because you were. You were born to live with him. And it's measurable. So sickness leaves when the king comes. It's measurable. What he doesn't give leaves when he comes. What is not from him leaves when he comes. Thanksgiving brings him in. It opens the floodgates. And then once he comes, my heart awakens to his majesty. So I start praising him. And praise has nothing to do with Michael. So when I'm informing the Lord in a song about how I'm doing, it is not praise. Now there's a place for writing songs like that. It's just not praise. We see praise introduced to Israel when the children of Israel cross the Red Sea. The entire song, Moses and Miriam's song, is vertical. It's all about Jesus, the wonderful Savior. Praise is vertical. Praise breaks fetters, the Bible says. It breaks fetters, chains break in an atmosphere of praise. And it's not mysterious what I'm talking about. It's in the Bible. He inhabits praise. He lives there. He doesn't visit it. He lives there. 
with every proper declaration, with every authentic declaration in song or in the spirit, whatever the Lord's doing in the moment, every time I do that, I'm putting a brick on a house built for the Lord. He lives there. And the scripture says, the fetters of the princes, the fetters fall off. They are broken. What princes? Demonic princes. Praise breaks their fetters. When you want to take a sword out and, and, and execute revenge, God wants you to sing a song. It makes no sense. David's greatest weapon was the harp, not the sword. Why? He likes it. He's a king, so we say, yes, you like it? We give it to you. <laughs> so I don't feel like it. Praise him long enough and he'll change the way you feel. Are you with me? Praise releases his kingdom. What is the kingdom? The dominating presence of the king. I love that. Kingdom foundations. We're taking the best one tonight. Jesus Christ. Let there be no other foundation laid than that which has been laid. Jesus Christ is the king. He's the king. I'll never forget the Holy Spirit saying this to me. The king dumb without the king is dumb. <laughs> king dumb principle without the presence. Yeah, it works, but it's not the Christian life. When you got saved, you met Jesus. You fell in love with Jesus. You listened to As the Deer like 400 times. And it never got old. By the way, what songs should you use in meetings? The ones that work. Who cares if they're old or new? Use the ones that bring him in. I just, in Brazil, I had Matt Gilman with me. We sing I Exalt Thee and Alleluia and Agnes Dei. It worked. He came. You say, well, I mean, we can't sing it too much. Worthy as the Lamb is on repeat eternally at the throne. God's not over it. He's not, I, I don't like this. Go to song six. There's no song six. Worthy is the Lamb of God. This is what's happening, I'm telling you. This is what's going on in the earth. The bridal heart is emerging, it's panting, it's crying out, oh, I want my beloved. I want him to come back, yes, and reign, but I want him right now, I've gotta have him. 24 seven, I can't live without it. What did Billy Graham preach? Jesus. What does it say on Bunky's tombstone? He preached Jesus. I've read Catherine's journals. Everyone begins with this. Dearest Jesus. What did the apostles preach? Jesus. What was the difference between their message and the people that wanted to kill them? They weren't preaching some ethereal, faded away concept of God. They drew a line. <laughs> well, I have a green line. A line in the sand. The line of demarcation was this, the Messiah has come and you killed him and he is the king of kings and he's been raised from the dead. The Jesus you murdered, they said, is the prince and lord of glory. This was their message. Why were they imprisoned? Because they preached Jesus. Whose name did they tell them not to use? The name of Jesus. What was Paul's ultimate ambition? That I might know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. What did Paul say? He said, I preached Jesus unto them. Him we preach. Him. Him we preach. Not that. Not the how-to. I preach a man who is also God. And when I preach, he comes because he's not deaf. He hears me. My sermons are 
invitations. He's actually depending on me to represent him or represent him. So when I preach him, he says, I like that. I'm coming. This is the church's message. And this is what's happening. Man, I had so many outline notes. It would have been so good. <laughs> look, 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 look. Revival is Jesus. I got invited to do this TV show, and the host said this to me. It's so funny. He goes, um, what are you going to talk about? It's like one of the biggest shows in the world. I said, um, I had... This was like 2009, and I had just met Jesus all over again through this series of encounters. And he captured my soul. I'm telling you, I was reaching for so many things. Every time I'd meet with Oral, how do I see more people healed? He'd go, find Jesus again. I'm like, no, no, you didn't hear the question. I got the Jesus thing. I'm talking about miracles. He'd say, boy, gosh, you are a tough student. I asked Rex Humbard the same thing. How, how do I see more? Jesus calls the man. I go, what does that even mean? They all speak in like these weird codes. <laughs> you know? What are you saying? What it can't be? I got the Jesus thing. I'm talking about the depths, you know, the supernatural. My soul's saved. I don't, I'm good, but take me deeper. So I fasted and prayed because I didn't know what I was doing. And you, you see enough people die of sickness and not get saved in your church. Our church grew from 400 to 75 in one month. It grew the wrong way. It's actually, it was really good for me. I discovered it's not by might. It's not by power. It's really by the Holy Spirit. So I shut away. With a jug of water, 21 day fast, 40 day fast. I went to every meeting, I, I'm telling you, I, I went to every service, young and old, I was hungry. You ever been there? Hopefully that's why you're here. So after an encounter on October 23rd, 2007, my life changed. In Westport, Connecticut, the glory of God fell on me. Just like it did when I was a kid in my father-in-law's meeting in 1989. You ever had those moments where you feel like the universe stops because God's thinking about you? And that's really the reason you're crying? I can't believe you're thinking about me. <laughs> I discovered he's got a lot going on. So right after that encounter, I was asked to be on this show, and the, the pastor says, what are you going to talk about? I said, Pastor, I'm going to talk about Jesus. He goes, uh, I know, but, like, what are you really going to talk about? And I go, uh, I'm really going to talk about Jesus. He goes, we have 26 minutes to fill. How are you going to talk about Jesus for 26 minutes? I mean, it's one of the biggest shows in the world. And I go, oh, now I know I was born. When a pastor who's got a church of 15,000 can't talk about the Christ who bought his church for 26 minutes, we need revival. When I wrote the Jesus book, another show called, they said, we want to have you on the show, but we need something deeper than the Jesus book. I said, um, oh man, I said, it took me 18 months. I poured my guts into that one. I don't have anything. I'm like, I left it all in the field there. Like, <laughs> like, no, 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 we need the Jesus thing, cool. But this is a Christian show. We need something deeper. And I go, look, if you want a story about a portal that opened and a green-faced Martian holding an angel's hand came down and riding on a unicorn <laughs> and shot me up through the roof, I don't have one of those stories, but... I do love Jesus, and I'm seeing the sick healed, and people saved, and him filling people with his spirit, and devils are being cast out, and the dead are being raised. Is that good enough? So the Holy Spirit now is awakening his people. 
John Wesley said, true simplicity is loving affection for Jesus and Jesus alone. Charles Spurgeon said this. He actually wrote this to a preacher. Man, these guys were something. This preacher preached a message without mentioning the name of Christ. It so puzzled Spurgeon that he said, Sir, go home and do not return to the pulpit until you have something worth saying. What did Mother Edder preach? Christ crucified, buried, raised again, the day of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, Christ the healer. What did Amy preach? Jesus healer, savior, baptizer, and soon coming king. Why such results? Because when you preach Jesus, hell starts to tremble. Hell, hell listen, I'm, I'm, finding, I'm finding this, whether it's a stadium or a house group. You lift him up, his power comes down. He responds to the focused exaltation of Jesus Christ. You talk to Mike Bickle, he's going to talk to you about Jesus more than prayer. If you sat with my father-in-law, he's going to talk to you about Jesus non-stop. He is addicted longer than you want him to. He'll keep you up all night. He does it to me all the time. Like, I'm like, bub, I want to go to bed. You know, you got to hear this. You got to hear. I, I, he, he memorizes entire chapters of the Bible and tries to find Jesus in Genesis. And then he wants to talk about it, which is awesome, but he goes a long time. So, <laughs> what's the point? What did. What did all of these greats do and talk about? Jesus. So the message now is, it's narrowing. It's narrowing. So Jesus, Jesus said, narrow is the way. Few find it. What is he talking about? Grit your teeth? No. He's the narrow way. He is the way. He is the truth. He's the life. Paul writes, let there be no other foundation laid than Jesus Christ. I, I, I challenge every worship leader in here to take a year and write songs to Jesus. If you don't know what to write, just use the Psalms. <laughs> They're awesome. We just took communion on Sunday night. A lady walked in with a tumor on her arm, stage four cancer. And in his presence, just in his presence, you can watch it. You can watch it on YouTube. That tumor instantly disappears. She was at the Holy Land experience in Orlando. It's like a theme park. And a lady there said, oh, there's these people meeting in these, these Jesus meetings. They're, they're having these meetings. You have stage four cancer? You need to get up there. She came all dressed up. And she said, some lady told me to come. And we received communion. She, the, the tumor absolutely disappeared. I felt it. I felt it with my own arm. We've seen people with holes in their faces. Their faces fill in. Literal holes in their faces from injury. The tissue filled in. A 12-year-old girl completely. That's what happens when the Lord comes. You're not going to forsake the miraculous. It's going to multiply. I promise you. I told our staff, why don't devils manifest in our meetings? I don't like that. Do they like our meetings? Are we ministering to them? Are they? I said, I want devils leaving. I know they're walking in with them. Why aren't they leaving? What's going on? We started lifting up Jesus. Those devils started flying out of people. Jesus said, if devils be cast out, it's because the kingdom has come. Jesus, it's, it's what he's like. You get him, listen, you get it all. Every one of my friends who went to Brownsville say the same thing. I said, what did you feel there? They said, the presence of God. 
What does everybody talk about who went to Toronto? What did they feel? The presence of God. Was it somebody's perfect preaching? No, it wasn't the preaching. The presence of God puts your preaching on steroids. You could sing Old MacDonald. People think you're phenomenal. <laughs> the answer to a bad message is the presence coming because everybody forgets it. <laughs> you know the Lord will do that. He'll come just to get us to forget about what we heard. He's like, I didn't like that. <laughs> I want you to love him. I want, I want it to become more crystallized. More direct. How good is the news without Jesus? It's not good. It's really bad news without Jesus. It's scary news. the Lord to awaken us. He misses our attention. It's, it's not about Jesus so that we can have a better meeting. It's not about Jesus so we can find our destiny. He's our destiny. He's not a means to a, a better destination. He's, he's it. Who else said these words, come unto me? If you're weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I tell our people, if you know more about Jesus' image than Jesus, then I've failed. I heard Candace Johnson say, if you leave Reading and you know more, about, know more about the culture of Bethel than Jesus himself, we've failed. I, I feel the Holy Spirit taking the holy sword of heaven and trimming all the fat. This was never meant to be about anything else. Do you remember, how many of you remember when you got saved? Do you remember that feeling? Do you remember what the, it looked like outside the building? Or what, the next day, oh, everything's beautiful. Everything is wonderful. You love your enemies. You like, you can't put your Bible down. The first book I ever read was the book of Revelation. It didn't really even freak me out. I, I didn't know what else to read. I thought, I'm going to start at the end. I want to know how this thing ends. So then I read the whole New Testament right after that in a week. Do you remember that? Remember those days? When I got saved, Ron Canoli was like the Kanye West of the kingdom. I listened to, I thought, I actually thought the only Christian, I thought this, the only Christian CD in existence was this one by Ron Canoli. So that's the only one I listened to for a year. Non-stop. I couldn't stop telling people about Jesus. I gave Jesus my spare time. I know I'm walking a tightrope. But Billy Graham said, show me your checkbook and your calendar and I'll know everything I need to know about you. 
Jesus doesn't have our time. He doesn't have us. Do you, but do you, do you remember? Do you remember the sense in your heart? I am redeemed. I am clean. I am in love. And you were burning. I told my aunt, you need to give your life to Jesus. I was born again for like a week. And I come from a Greek family. They will slap you even if you do well. <laughs> you don't even have to misbehave. Seriously. One of the ways we tell each other we love each other is we slap each other. And if you misbehave and you told another family member, hey, Yaya slapped me. Oh, why would you do? I talked back to her. You did what? Psh. Then you got slapped by two of them. And it would just keep going. These are the kind of women I grew up with. I told my aunt over dinner, you need Jesus. You're going to hell. She said, what? I said, you're going to hell. It wasn't the greatest evangelism tactic. <laughs> but it was true. It's still true today. Even in our God is love circles. If you don't know Jesus, you go to hell. We still need to remember that. It's still real. There is one name under heaven by which men can be saved. Just one. So I told her, she said, why am I going to hell? I said, because you're a sinner. <laughs> she said, how do you know? I go, I just read it and I had my Bible on it. I said, because the Bible says we're all sinners. She said, if you call me a sinner one more time, I'm going to slap the lips off your face. Her name was Bubby. I said, but Bubby, you're a sinner. You need to give your life to Jesus. I took my Bible. I walked down the road to carry it to my dad's shop to tell people about Jesus. Pray for anything that moves. Pray for, remember when you prayed for your car that ran out of gas? And somehow you got to the meeting? Do you remember those days? Do you remember when you underlined more than you didn't underline in your Bible? Do you remember when you ruined the ink on the other side of your Bible and the other page was illegible? Do you remember that? You, you don't even know. You do, well, I don't know why I'm highlighting this. I, I must be in love. I just like it. I have no clue what it means. You're reading Deuteronomy. You're like, this is so good. You have no clue. Just, it's all just awesome. All of it. Do you remember that? Back in the 90s, we wore suits everywhere. Gladly. My father-in-law would fire tunnel 15,000 people, and I had to catch them all in a suit. That's why I don't even come close to wearing suits anymore. I've been delivered, and I'm scarred deeply. <laughs> but I, do, you know what, do you remember that? Oh, he's so beautiful. Remember when you wept over stuff that seemed so minimal? Like someone who preached on stoning the sorceress and you're weeping you're weeping thinking about numbers you're just because uh. it was about Jesus then when you read your Bible you could almost picture him and then somewhere along the way what the Song of Solomon talks about somebody comes along with ready wisdom And it sounds like this, bro, this is a long race. It's not a sprint. You remember that one? This is a marathon. Slow it down a little. In fact, balance it out. I think some meetings, I think we call some meetings balanced when they should be called funerals. That nothing about Jesus is balanced. There is not a single aspect of his nature that is average. When Jesus heals, he heals big time. When somebody gets filled with the Spirit, they get filled with the Spirit and fire. It's pretty dramatic. You ever seen a demon come out in a balanced way? Just, a, just enough froth, just enough, not both sides, just enough, just, just the right tone in the screeching. Shake a little bit, not too much. You ever see somebody sort of get born again in the most balanced way? Because being born again is 
That's pretty average, right? That's balance. That's just a small deal. You know Jesus doesn't change us when we're born again. He replaces us. We go from death to life. I tell our students, we are not life coaches. We raise the dead. We bring the dead to life. That's what the gospel does. We are not here to adjust and tweak. We are not chiropractors. We are bringing the dead to life. That's not balanced, Jesus. His love is not balanced. You ever seen somebody receive the love of the Father? What's balanced about that? What's balanced about someone jumping out of a wheelchair? You ever see them get up and not give God too much glory? They just want to give Him just enough. Just the most balanced way. What about Jesus' holiness is balanced? He's not just a fire. He's a consuming fire. What about worship is balanced at the throne? He has beings who are covered in eyes inside and out saying holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That doesn't sound balanced. His floor, the flooring, it's not wood paneling. It is a sea of glass with fire shooting out of it. How many hosts are around him? Thousands upon ten thousands. Ten thousands upon ten thousands. What about the descent into hell was balanced? Jesus took the keys back and took captivity captive. Do you realize when Jesus got out of the, came out of the grave that the saints came out with him? That's what Matthew says if you read it carefully. It didn't happen at the cross. It says when he was raised, they came out with him. What's normal about that? What if the cemetery's emptied in Raleigh? And your saintly grandmother tonight came knocking on your door. Wait, I'm not turning that down to make a dead church more comfortable. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that, that there's an icy heart right here, but I'm not. No, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to melt your heart with the fire of the Spirit. I'm not going there. When Jesus was raised, they came out with him. That's why we don't fear the grave. He embarrassed the devil. He actually took the keys back and took captivity captive. He took his friends back. And the earth shook because the earth could not hold its creator. This is the gospel. It's powerful. To make it even better, when he ascended, as I said, he ascended above the highest heights. Do you know what he also did at one point? He poured out his own blood on the mercy seat of heaven. Picture this. Jesus goes up with a glorified body, with his own blood. Can you imagine what the angels were doing? They're like, whoa, this is crazy. Like what? What a plan? That's why Ephesians 3 says that they learn through the church. And he pours his blood out on the mercy seat. And guess what? The blood still screams. Righteous, 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 clean, children, children, children. You're not accused today because he did that. I'm going to end now. But I want you, with everything in me, to fall in love with Jesus. What began when you first got saved was not supposed to calm down. It was supposed to multiply every day. And if you were cut open in the deepest recesses of your spirit, the answer to every question that ever comes your way would be, I have nothing to say but this. It's found in Jesus. Thank you.